Hi guys. It is turning into a beautiful Sunday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. Is today the last day of spring or is it the first day of summer? It is Sunday, June 20th, 2021. I think it is the last day of spring before the summer of 2021 officially gets here. So, uh, we're going to have our Sunday sermon today. We are, I have finally rediscovered Chris Hedges, did not know where he, where he, that man has disappeared to. So we're going to hear from Chris for today's sermon. Just a couple of quick pieces of Collapse Chronicles housekeeping. Okay, guys, I think at the last count, we were at 30, somewhere between 35 and 38 people signing up for the live stream saying they're in with uh, starting a weekly Collapse Chronicles live stream. So I th we got somewhere between 12 and 15 more people needing to say I'm in. And we'll try to figure that out. I noticed some missing names that have not said I'm in yet. I noticed Osama number five. No, Osama number five is not said I'm in. I noticed Basil and Karen Peterson Neither one of them have shown any interest in joining a Collapse Chronicles live chat. I notice uh, Jeremy Jimenez. Uh, I have not heard from Jeremy Jimenez that he's in. So there's four names that would get us uh, over 40. But anyway, if you're interested in that, just say I'm in. And we will. when we hit 50, we'll figure that out. The other thing is, being Sunday, you know, it was supposed to be the day to uh, publish this week's interview. Uh, reluctantly, guys, I need to announce we are putting the Collapse Chronicles interviews on hold for a few weeks. Uh, ben is a very busy man, and uh, this is adding a lot to his workload, so... I don't want to stress that young man about, you know, having to do this every week. So we're going to get a few in the pipeline. So uh, my guess is the interviews will probably resume in about a month. So uh, we will be back on with those, I'm hoping, and uh, take some of the stress off of, off of Ben down there in Australia. And uh, because I'm a busy man, too. So anyway, but in lieu of not having a video, not having an interview, we are going to resume our Sunday sermons to take up the slack. And uh, I want to thank Realize, 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 who is my roommate here, for pointing out that Chris Hedges, you know, who left Truth Dig uh, a few months ago, along with Robert Shear, has moved over. So Robert Shear, I guess, has his own website called Shear Post. S C H E E R P O S T. Shear Post. Dot com where that is where Chris Hedges and and Robert Shear and probably some of the others uh, after that fallout at Truth Dig. So uh, I am glad to have rediscovered Chris Hedges because it's been way too long. So uh, I'm going to put the link on here and you can read this sermon yourself. Classic Chris, the unraveling of the American Empire. Yes, U.S. leadership has stumbled from one military debacle to another, a trajectory mirroring the sad finales of other historical imperial powers. And this is one of Chris's main themes is about the decline and fall of the American Empire. I'm not going to have time to read this whole thing. I'm going to put the link on to it. Read it yourself. But uh, I will be glad to sit here and sermonize for you. 
Uh, we're going to read the beginning and the end, and you can read the middle yourself. <clears throat> okay. Take it away, Chris Hedges, and talk to us about the decline of the American Empire. <clears throat> America's defeat in Afghanistan is one in a string of catastrophic military blunders that herald the death of the American Empire. With the exception of the first Gulf War, fought largely by mechanized units in the open desert that did not wisely attempt to occupy Iraq, the United States political and military leadership has stumbled from one military debacle to another. Korea, Vietnam, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, the trajectory of military fiascos mirrors the sad finales <clears throat> of the Chinese, Ottoman, Habsburg, Russian, French, British, Dutch, Portuguese, and Soviet empires. While each of these empires decayed with their own peculiarities, they all exhibited patterns of disillusion that characterized the American experiment. Imperial ineptitude is matched by domestic ineptitude. The collapse of good government at home with legislative, executive, and judicial systems all seized by corporate power ensures that the incompetent and the corrupt those dedicated not to our national interest, but to swelling the profits of the oligarchic elites, lead the country into a cul-de-sac. Rulers and military leaders driven by venal self-interest are often buffoonish characters in a grand comic operetta. How else to think of Alan Dulles, Dick Cheney, George W. Bush, Donald Trump, or now the hapless Joe Biden? Yes, while their intellectual and moral vacuity is often darkly amusing, it is murderous and savage when directed towards their victims. <clears throat> there is not a single case since 1941 when the coups, political assassinations, election fraud, black propaganda, blackmail, kidnapping, brutal counterinsurgency campaigns, U.S. sanctioned massacres, torture in global black sites, proxy wars or military interventions carried out by the United States resulted in the establishment of a democratic government. The two decades long wars in the Middle East, the greatest strategic blunder in American history, have only left in their wake one failed state after another, yet no one in the ruling class is held accountable. War, when it is waged to serve utopian absurdities, such as implanting a client government in Baghdad that will flip the region, including Iran, into U.S. protectorates, or when, as in Afghanistan, there is no vision at all, descends into a quagmire. The massive allocation of money and resources to the U.S. military 
which includes Biden's request for $715 billion for the Defense Department in fiscal year 2022, which is an $11.3 billion or 1.6% increase over 2021 is not, in the end, about national defense. The bloated military budget is designed <clears throat> primarily to keep the American economy from collapsing. All we really make anymore is our weapons. Once this is understood, which it never will be, once this is understood, perpetual war makes sense, at least for those who profit from it. The idea that America is a defender of democracy, liberty, and human rights would come as a huge surprise to those who saw their democratically elected governments subverted and overthrown by the United States in Panama, 1941, Syria, 1949, Iran, 1953, Guatemala, 1954, Congo, 1960, Brazil, 1964, Chile, 1973, Honduras, 2009, and Egypt, 2013. And this list does not include a host of other governments that, however despotic, as was the case in South Vietnam, Indonesia, or Iraq, were viewed as inimical to American interest and destroyed, in each case making life for the inhabitants of these countries even more miserable. I spent two decades on the outer reaches of empire as a foreign correspondent. The flowery rhetoric used to justify the subjugation of other nations so corporations can plunder their natural resources and exploit cheap labor is solely for domestic consumption. The generals, intelligence operatives, diplomats, bankers, and corporate executives that manage empire find this idealistic talk risable. They despise, with good reason, naive liberals who call for, quote, humanitarian intervention and believe the ideals used to justify empire are real, that empire can be a force for good. <clears throat> These liberal interventionists, the useful idiots of imperialism, attempt to civilize a process that was created and designed to repress, intimidate, plunder, and dominate the liberal interventionists because they wrap themselves in high ideals are responsible for numerous military and foreign policy debacles. They, the call by liberal interventionists such as Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Susan Rice, and Samantha Power to fund jihadists in Syria and depose Myanmar Gaddafi in Libya, rent these countries, as in Afghanistan and Iraq, into warring fiefdoms. The liberal interventionists are also the tip of the spear in the campaign to ratchet up tensions with China and Russia. <clears throat> And, um, guys, this is, I, I'm going to, uh, good Lord, I'm just going to, I'm just going to have to 
skip over the middle of this because I want to look at the larger picture before my battery collapses on my camera. If the battery collapses, you will have to finish this out on your own. But okay, this is the bigger picture of the, um, the collapse of the American empire compared to former collapses of empire. <clears throat> Take it away, Chris Edges. Our decades-long military fiascos, a feature of all late empires, are called micromilitarism. The Athenians engaged in micromilitarism during the Peloponnesian Wars from 431 to 404 BC when they invaded Sicily, suffering the loss, suffering the loss of 200 ships and thousands of sh soldiers. <clears throat> that defeat triggered successful revolts throughout the Athenian Empire. The Roman Empire, which at its height lasted for two centuries, created a military machine that, like the Pentagon, was a state within a state. Rome's military rulers, led by Augustus, snuffed out the remnants of Rome's anemic democracy and ushered in a period of despotism that saw the empire disintegrate under the weight of the extravagant military expenditures and corruption. The British Empire, after the suicidal military folly of World War I, was terminated in 1956 when it attacked Egypt in a dispute over the nationalization of the Suez Canal. Britain was forced to withdraw in humiliation, empowering Arab nationalist leaders such as Egypt's uh, Nasser in dooming British rule over its few remaining colonies. None of these empires recovered. This is, uh, he quotes historian Alfred McCoy from his book, In the Shadow of the American Century, The Rise and Decline of U.S. Global Power, quote, while rising empires are often judicious, even rational in their application of armed force for conquests and control over overseas dominions, fading empires are inclined to ill-considered displays of power, dreaming of bold military masterstrokes that would somehow recoup lost prestige and power often irrational even from an imperialist point of view, these micro-military op operations can yield hemorrhaging expenditures or humiliating defeats that only accelerate the process already underway." Close quote. Thank you, Alfred McCoy, for explaining that. Back to Chris, <clears throat> the worse it gets at home, the more the empire needs to fabricate enemies within and without. This is the real reason for the increase in tensions with Russia and China. The poverty of half the nation and concentration of wealth in a tiny oligarchic cabal the wanton murder of unarmed civilians by militarized police, the rage at the ruling elites expressed with nearly half the electorate voting for a con artist and demagogue and a mob of his supporters storming the Capitol are the internal signs of disintegration. Because of the loss of unionized jobs, the real decline of wages, deindustrialization, chronic underemployment and unemployment, and punishing austerity programs, the country 
is plagued by a plethora of diseases of despair, including opioid addictions, alcoholism, suicides, gambling, depression, morbid obesity, <clears throat> and mass shootings. <coughs> These are the consequences of a deeply troubled society. <clears throat> the facade of empire is able to mask the rot within its foundations often for decades until, as we saw with the Soviet Union, the empire appears to suddenly disintegrate. <clears throat> Here we go again, guys. I've been having, uh, Chris has been having this rant for 10 years. <clears throat> the loss of the dollar as the global reserve currency will probably mark the final chapter of the American Empire. In 2015, the US dollar accounted for 90% of bilateral transactions between China and Russia, a percentage that has now fallen to about 50%. The use of sanctions as a weapon against China and Russia pushes these countries to replace the U.S. dollar with their own national currencies. Russia, as part of this move away from the dollar, has begun accumulating yuan reserves, you know, the, the Chinese dollar reserves. The loss of the dollar as the world's reserve currency will instantly raise the cost of imports. It will result in unemployment of Depression-era levels. It will force the empire to dramatically contract. It will, as the economy worsens, fuel a hyper-nationalism that will most likely be expressed through a Christianized fascism. The mechanisms already in place for total social control, militarized police, a suspension of civil liberties, wholesale government surveillance, enhanced terrorism laws that railroad people into the world's largest prison systems, and censorship overseen by the digital media. Mon monopolies will seamlessly cement into place a police state. Nations that descend into crises these severe seek to deflect the rage of a betrayed population on foreign scapegoats, or now I would say, Chris, space aliens. China and Russia, or space aliens, will be used to fill these roles. The defeat in Afghanistan is a familiar and sad story, one all those blinded by imperial hubris endure. The tragedy, however, is not the collapse of the empire, but that lacking the ability to engage in self-critique and self-correction as it dies, it will lash out in a blind, inchoate fury at innocence at home and abroad. There you go. Amen, Brother Chris. Uh, you know, this whole thing about the collapse of the American dollar, you know, I've been down this rabbit hole since 2008, and I, from the very beginning, uh, you know, I, I've been, this has been probably the one place where Chris Hedges and Alex Jones are, are, are screaming the same, are beating the same drum, and while we've been beating the drum now for 13 years i you know i still say if if chris hedges and alex jones 
uh, agree on something, it's probably worth listening to. Uh, but we shall see when the long-awaited uh, collapse of the American dollar as the world reserve currency finally happens. But of course, by the time that happens, I personally think we're going to have bigger problems to worry about in the deep end of the doomsday prophecy pool. But uh, it's all a big ball of wax, guys. You know, trying to separate the shallow end of the doomsday prophecy pool from the deep end. It gets harder every day. Uh, anyway, enjoy your swim in the uh, doomsday prophecy pool as we enter the summer of 2021. Promises to be a doozy. I am very glad. Uh, I am in upstate New York in the summer of 2021, and come see us at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Bye, guys. Yes, little dog, did you survive that? You can get back to your chippies now. <laughs>